I think that on balance that this government has pursued a quite negative and divisive kind of foreign policy at a very moment when Canada, I think, really needs to be working with other partners in other countries to be dealing with a whole range of very pressing issues uh, from security uh, to, uh, to climate change and other environmental issues. Many people have pointed out that uh, there's a propensity, I think, uh, for the Harper government to rely on loud pronouncements. Uh, and if you receive, as I do, the press releases by email, uh, it's a string of, you know, the of more exaggerated adjectives one after another. Uh, as opposed to, I think, the long, hard, steady, continuous work of cultivating and maintaining and building relationships uh, with uh, a broad array of partners in both the bilateral settings and in multilateral settings. I think it's a foreign policy that has departed very significantly from a, a long-standing and quite proud diplomatic tradition of this country as a promoter and a facilitator of international consensus on issues that matter to Canada. That's not a liberal or a conservative tradition. It's a Canadian tradition. It dates back well before the Pearson era. And in more recent times, I think its most effective practitioner uh, was indeed a conservative prime minister, Brian Mulroney, who invested in diplomacy, who invested in Canada's uh, multilateral connections, who showed in, through this investment, through the attention, the ongoing attention he gave to, uh, to this kind of diplomacy, what could be done. What could be done on international environmental issues? What could be done on human rights issues, principled issues? What could be done within the Canada-US relationship on core economic interests? And that, in the end of the day, to me, the biggest disappointment uh, with this government's foreign policy, the Harper government's foreign policy, has been ultimately that it hasn't been terribly effective, even in its own terms. You know, the Prime Minister has talked and throughout his career about putting Canada's interests front and centre, including Canada's economic interests. But the truth is that, as Laura was just describing, on some critical economic issues, including our relations with that most important of our economic partners, our principal customer, that country that we do the most to work together with when it comes to producing things together, the United States, that relationship has not been going well. I'd be interested, you know, what grade you, each of you, would give to the Harper government over the last eight years or so uh, in terms of its relations with the United States. I can't imagine on economic relations with the U.S. giving more than a C plus because, I mean, in truth, if, if Mr. Harper were the CEO of a company, the failure to achieve, forget setting aside the, the kind of slow down on the work towards facilitating the border, which is, of course, crucial, bread and butter stuff that Laura can speak to. But on that crucial issue about achieving the approval for Keystone Pipeline, which has been identified by the government itself as a critical issue, that failure, I think, for a CEO would have pretty grave repercussions in somebody in that context. All of that is, I think, a reflection of a deeper, and a deeper problem. And I've thought a bit about this and, and concluded it might be um, you know, a bit too much of a sweeping statement. But I get the feeling that there is almost not only a distaste for, but almost a distrust of diplomacy itself from the current government. We don't go along to get along seems to apply just as much to our friends as it does to our adversaries. You know, Canada, the bottom line is, if you've traveled around, you know this, Canada has simply become a lot harder to get along with. And here's the point. The point is that that does not serve our interests in the end. It doesn't serve our interests to have the United States go to the, to have Mr. Harper go to the United States and say, we will not take no for an answer. How does that move the decider, the one person who can make the positive decision, any closer to the decision that you need? It doesn't. It doesn't serve our interests, I would argue, to cut off our contact with the Russian president uh, when there are a lot of other issues other than Ukraine for us to be discussing, including the Arctic. It doesn't serve our interest to withdraw our embassies, willfully deafening and blinding ourselves to what is going on within another country, and especially considering that somehow we managed to keep our embassy in the Soviet Union open throughout the Cold War. It doesn't 
serve our interests to deal with one of our closest partners, Mexico, in the way that we've handled the visa issue with them. Kind of uh, slapping uh, visas on Mexicans coming to Canada and then not expeditiously moving to regularize that situation. It's been going on for years. It doesn't serve our interests to say not only that the UN needs to be reformed, of course the UN needs to be reformed, but to say we're not going to be part of that discussion anymore, which is just removing ourselves from a whole bunch of tables where other diplomacy takes place. It doesn't serve our interests, in my view, to unnecessarily alienate our friends. Yeah, there are times when you say no, and there are times when friends will be alienated. But it's the unnecessary quality that is so uh, unfortunate, like becoming the only country of the world to pull out of the uh, Convention on to Combat Desertification right before the, the, uh, the body is supposed to be holding its next meeting in Bonn. And you know, how does one expect that to go over with our partner, uh, the German government? It doesn't serve our interest to pontificate about NATO and Ukraine when we have been not investing in NATO for the last couple of years. All of this is part of what diplomacy is about. It's about recognizing that actions in some areas have reverberating effects for relationships for good or for bad uh, in other areas. So instead of reaching out to environmental groups, if you choose to, choose to label them as foreign intruders, to stigmatize them as radicals who are trying to subvert the national interest. By the way, that's pretty much what was said. Then don't be surprised if the same groups who are transnational NGOs choose to make your pipeline the political litmus test for the US administration. If you choose to go to the United Nations when the Palestinian observer status, state status is being debated, at a time when the United States and Arab countries had apparently essentially said, this is going to pass, so we're going to play it down. And you choose to go down and not just object, which you can do, but choose to give a fiery speech. Well, don't be surprised if the people in the audience take note. Don't be surprised if the US ambassador to the UN, who later becomes the National Security Advisor in the White House takes note. Reverberating effects, unnecessary, unnecessary alienation. The paradox is this, that Canada is very good at diplomacy. We have needed to be good at diplomacy. It's not just a national habit. It has been a tradition, but it's been a tradition for a reason. Because we've had to be good at diplomacy given our position in the world. You know, if the, if the United States of George W. Bush, the most powerful country to have ever existed on the face of the earth, could not succeed with a strategy of you know, our way or the highway, then how could anyone expect Canada as the P18 or P23, depending on how you measure it, to succeed at such a strategy? So there's a reason why we've been good and there's a reason why we have to reconnect with these traditions, because it's in our interest to do so. And I'm pleased uh, to end on a positive note that when I travel, when I check when my reading of opinion polls, uh, when I speak to students in universities, uh, when people come to the events that we hold, and when I see Canadians overseas, that there continues to be a very strong appetite for a more positive, a more constructive, a more cooperative, a more forward-looking, a more diplomatic Canada. So all we need is a political agenda to embrace that wish. Thank you, Roland. Um, we've got some time for questions. We have a microphone. Uh, 